Sunday, 27 June 1976, Air France Flight 139 takes off from Tel Aviv for Paris via Athens. 188 passengers and 12 crew are on board. In Athens, another 58 passengers board the plane, including four terrorists. Shortly after leaving Athens, the hijackers take control of the cockpit. They redirect the flight to Benghazi, Libya for refueling and then to Entebbe Airport in Uganda. Landing in the middle of the night, the plane full of hostages is met by three more terrorists and army troops supplied by Uganda's dictator, the infamous Idi Amin. The hostages are moved to the old, disused airport terminal where they are kept under armed guard. Meanwhile, the hijackers issue their demands. Five million dollars ransom and the release of 53 pro-Palestinian militants being held around the world. Their deadline, 2 p.m. on Thursday, 1st of July. Monday, 28 June, despite frantic diplomatic efforts from Israel, the US and even Egypt, the fate of the hostages is looking grim and the world holds its breath. Tuesday, 29 June, in a clear echo of the Holocaust, all the Israeli and Jewish hostages are separated from the other passengers. The French captain and crew all choose to remain with the Israeli group in solidarity. Wednesday, 30 June, the hijackers release 47 hostages from the non-Israeli group who immediately fly back to France where they are interviewed by Mossad. Thursday, 1st of July, the hijackers deadline. Israel, which has always refused to negotiate with terrorists, now agrees to begin negotiations. The hijackers extend the deadline to the 4th of July at noon and they release another group of 101 non-Israeli hostages. 106 hostages are now huddled in the old Entebbe airport terminal. Their families are terrified, fearing for the lives of their loved ones. It is a dreadful time as the whole world watches the drama unfold hour by hour and Jews around the world are very, very worried. From the moment news of the hijacking came in, the Israeli Defense Force had begun exploring a military option, but time was too short. Now with a few more days available, the IDF puts together an audacious plan. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and his cabinet deliberate, debate and agonize. To mount such a complicated and risky rescue operation nearly 4,000 kilometers away seems impossible, irresponsible, even reckless. But they also feel deeply about their responsibility for their citizens and fellow Jews alike. This isn't only a military decision, it is a moral decision. Shabbat, the 3rd of July, Israel's cabinet approves Operation Thunderbolt. Just a few hours later, a convoy takes off from Sharm El Sheikh. They fly at an average height of just 30 meters above the ground to avoid radar detection. 3rd of July, 2300. The first Israeli plane lands at Entebbe. A black Mercedes and several Land Rovers offload and drive down the runway. The cars are filled with the assault team of 29 Sayeret Matkal Special Forces Commandos dressed in Ugandan military uniforms. The brazenly brilliant plan is to replicate Idi Amin's own motorcade so the guards will allow them through. At first, it all goes smoothly. Then two sentries seem intent on stopping the motorcade. The Israelis open fire, their cover is blown. The commandos race to the terminal building and burst through the doors, shouting to the hostages, get down! The Israelis open fire, killing all the hijackers and armed guards. By this time, the three other transport planes land, miraculously stopping just short of a large pothole in the runway that would have crippled the entire mission. Armored personnel carriers roll out to provide defense as the commandos destroy 11 Ugandan MiG fighter planes on the ground, preventing an aerial pursuit. As the hostages leave the building and head for the planes, Ugandan troops open fire from the control tower, killing unit commander Yonatan Netanyahu, brother of current Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The Ugandans are quickly neutralized. Finally, with all the survivors safely aboard, the planes take off. The raid at Entebbe lasted in total 53 minutes. All the hijackers were killed along with a few dozen Ugandan soldiers. Half the Ugandan Air Force was destroyed. 102 hostages were rescued. Three were tragically killed during the crossfire. And one, 75-year-old Dora Bloch, who had been hospitalized, was brutally murdered by troops of Idi Amin. Sunday, 4th of July, 1976. 
As America celebrates its bicentennial, Israel celebrates another miraculous Jewish deliverance from death and danger. The entire world is amazed. It is the most stunning, daring, breathtaking hostage rescue in history. Jews around the world are filled with wonder, admiration and pride. The Israeli commandos become national heroes and Yoni Netanyahu becomes an icon, a heroic martyr for Israel's cause. Operation Thunderbolt, now officially renamed Operation Yonatan, becomes one of modern Israel's proudest moments and the stuff of legend. Three Hollywood movies are produced to tell the incredible tale of how Israel succeeded against such overwhelming odds. But Operation Yonatan is more than just a celebration of Jewish intelligence and chutzpah. It is an inspirational testimony to the courage and determination of the IDF and to Israel's leaders who fulfilled the Jewish principle of Kol Yisrael, Arevim Zebazeh. All of Israel is responsible for one another. And as the triumphant soldiers themselves acknowledged, it is a tribute to the unmistakable hand of God in the historic, remarkable rescue at Entebbe.